field trip with him can, can easily result in uh, 90 or more species sightings. So, <laughs> uh, if you get a chance to go on the field with him, you definitely should. So Dave uh, is going to speak to us uh, today. And actually, Dave, I don't have your title right here with you. Uh, maybe if you get us started, I guess we'll see that. All right. I'll just call it right up here. <clears throat> uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Well, well, maybe good. a little louder, Dave. All right. Um, let me see if I can. Is that a little better? Yeah. That's good. Yep. All right. All right. Uh, so I'll be talking today on... Uh, olfactory signaling and mimulus gutatus, uh, sending mixed messages to pollinators. Uh, but before I get uh, to the pollinator stuff, uh, uh, as uh, Mary said, I am uh, uh, the director of Blandy Experimental Farm, and uh, I feel obliged to uh, uh, do a little commercial here before I begin my actual <laughs> seminar. So. Uh, uh, Blandy Experimental Farm is one of uh, 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 three uh, ecology field stations at the University of Virginia. Uh, we're located in Clark County, Virginia, just uh, about uh, a little over 60 miles east of Washington, D.C. Uh, and our primary mission is to support uh, research for uh, undergraduate and graduate students and faculty. And uh, right here is uh, our our summer class from uh, 2023. In the summer, we usually have about uh, uh, 30 or so people working at Blandy. Uh, uh, Mary McKenna has been working at Blandy for many years. Uh, she's right here. Uh, uh, we offer uh, fellowships uh, for graduate students. So if you know any graduate students looking for field sites and looking for summer support, uh, uh, please send them our way. Uh, we also, uh, through the National Science Foundation's Research Experience for Undergraduates, uh, offer uh, fellowships for 10 undergraduates every year. Uh, and uh, uh, Mary is co-PI on our uh, uh, research experience for undergraduates grant. Uh, we just submitted a renewal just last week. Uh, and so hopefully we will be open for business in summer 2024. So if you know any promising undergraduates uh, who are interested in, in getting their feet wet doing some research, please send them our way. <clears throat> but... Uh, uh, Blandy is, is also home to the State Arboretum of Virginia. Uh, we're open to the public 365 days a year, uh, no admission charge. And so uh, if, if you have not been out to Blandy, uh, I uh, hereby extend you an invitation to come visit us, uh, either individually or perhaps uh, be a great field trip for uh, the big botanical society. So uh, hope to see you out at Blandy sometime soon. So with that, uh, let me get to uh, uh, today. Oops, today's seminar. So uh, uh, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but I feel obliged to just point out uh, how important uh, uh, plant pollinator interactions are. So 87% of angiosperms uh, are uh, biotically pollinated. So the vast majority of angiosperms are depending on uh, pollinators in order to complete uh, their reproductive uh, cycle. Uh, if you take a more human-centered uh, look uh, 75 different U.S. crops uh, are reported as biotically pollinated, uh, resulting in $34 billion a year uh, for the U.S. agricultural industry. Uh, so this is a very valuable uh, interaction and ecologically critical uh, interaction. And of course, all this value uh, comes at a price, and most of that price is paid by uh, the plants themselves. So uh, uh, 
the pollinators that visit these plants are provided rewards, uh, most commonly in the form of nectar, which for uh, many pollinators is their primary source of carbohydrates. And uh, for uh, bees especially, uh, pollen is their primary source of proteins and lipids. Uh, so uh, this interaction is typically characterized as a mutualism with the pollinators uh, providing this essential service of moving pollen uh, and uh, allowing uh, plants to uh, uh, set seed and fruit and the plant providing essential nutrition uh, for the pollinators. In order to attract pollinators, uh, plants have evolved uh, many traits uh, to uh, signal and stand out from, from the, the uh, rest of the environment. And probably the most studied, most well-studied aspect of this attraction are the visual cues uh, that, that plants provide. So flowers are, are uh, famously uh, uh, brightly colored uh, and attractive to pollinators standing out from, from the background. Uh, the coloration of the flowers might include even more subtle cues like nectar guides that bring uh, pollinators deeper into the flower where those rewards are. Uh, but uh, flowers also produce olfactory cues in the form of volatile organic compounds or VOCs. And uh, it's these VOCs that I'll be talking about today uh, primarily and uh, uh, although there's a, a long, rich history in looking at these visual cues, uh, uh, our ability to study these VOCs in detail is, is much more recent. So when uh, I first started thinking about VOCs, uh, I was very excited about thinking how VOCs, uh, these, these volatile signals, might relate uh, to the quality of, a, of the reward that a plant uh, had to offer. And I could imagine uh, two basic kinds of relationships. Uh, number one is a relationship uh, where the strength of the signal of the VOC is uh, either constant or uh, random with respect to uh, the reward. Uh, in either case, the signal would provide no information to the pollinator about reward quality. Uh, alternatively, uh, I could also imagine uh, that the strength of the signal might change uh, as the reward quality varied uh, from flower to flower. Uh, in that case, uh, flowers uh, that uh, have poor reward quality, perhaps signal uh, uh, more weakly, and those with higher reward quality might uh, signal more strongly. Uh, if that's the case, uh, a signal like this could be used uh, as, uh, an, as honest information to the pollinator, uh, and a, a pollinator might be able to uh, uh, alter its foraging behavior based on the strength of the signal. Uh, pollinators uh, that uh, visit flowers with weak signals uh, encounter poor rewards. Pollinators that uh, visit flowers with strong signals uh, encounter uh, flowers with, with uh, high rewards. Uh, and bees in particular being famously uh, good learners, uh, they should quickly alter their foraging behavior and favor uh, plants that produce the strongest signals. Uh, and uh, many authors have proposed that this should actually uh, create a selective force for these honest type signals uh, from plants. So today in my talk, I, I'm going to be talking about some some uh, older work that I've done on the response of pollinators to variation uh, 
uh, in pollen rewards in Mimulus guttatus. Uh, I'll follow this with, with some more recent work on uh, the volatile organic compounds uh, produced by Mimulus guttatus and how pollinators respond to these VOCs. So uh, I've been working on, on Mimulus guttatus uh, since I uh, was a postdoc in Michelle Dudash's lab, as Mary indicated in my introduction. Uh, uh, since my time as a postdoc, uh, the, the genus has been revised, and although our, our local native uh, uh, Eastern Mimulus are still called Mimulus, uh, many of the Western species are, are now in the genus Erythranthi, and uh, 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 th this is still a little controversial in the Mimulus community, uh, uh, so I'll just simply be referring uh, to, to my plant as Mimulus guttatus. <laughs> uh, Mimulus guttatus is a uh, Western species uh, of Mimulus uh, occurring basically uh, from uh, the, the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific coast, from uh, northern Mexico all the way north uh, into Alaska. So it's got it's got a broad Western range. Uh, Mimulus guttatus is primarily outcrossing. It's got an estimated outcrossing rate of about 70 percent. Uh, it produces little or no nectar, and, and that's a, uh, important to remember for my seminar. Uh, so it rewards pollinators almost exclusively uh, by pollen. Uh, Mimulus guttatus is typically uh, pollinated uh, by bumblebees. Uh, I used uh, in in most of my experiments, the bumblebee bombus, bombus impatiens, the common Eastern bumblebee. Uh, so its range does not overlap uh, at all with uh, the native range of, of Mimulus guttatus. Uh, but as you'll see, uh, bombus impatiens is available commercially. And so it, it, it was my, my best option for doing laboratory and greenhouse studies. Uh, the, this company, uh, uh, bio, well, Biobest and Copper, uh, will sell you a, a bumblebee hive any time of year for about $150. Uh, I first got the idea of looking at uh, how pollinators might respond to variation in uh, rewards in Mimulus guttatus while I was a postdoc with, with Michelle Dudash. Uh, uh, Michelle and I were studying uh, the effects and genetic basis of inbreeding in uh, Mimulus guttatus. And one of the most consistent responses we saw uh, in, in all the populations that we looked at was that as plants became more inbred, uh, the amount of pollen uh, they produced uh, decreased drastically and the viability of that pollen uh, decreased drastically. Uh, uh, for a plant that uh, rewards primarily by pollen, uh, this suggested to me that inbred plants might not offer pollinators uh, uh, the same quality of reward uh, that, uh, that outbred plants might be able to provide. Uh, the the uh, decrease in pollen viability is interesting because uh, we found that uh, uh, pollen viability uh, correlates pretty strongly with the amount of protein in the pollen. And protein is one of those two uh, essential nutrients that pollen provides. And so uh, a plant that's producing very little pollen with low viability uh, has very little protein to offer a pollinator uh, visiting that flower. And so we set up uh, some experiments in the greenhouse uh, where uh, we, uh, in, in a, a randomized experiment, uh, 
uh, provided bees with uh, Mimulus gutatus that had either been fully outbred, uh, self for one generation or self for two generations. And we lay these out on greenhouse tables. Uh, and, and by the way, we, we arrange them in trays, eight, eight plants per tray that, that you'll see in my graphs, I call an octet. Uh, that was to ensure we had plenty of flowers uh, at any given time for any given group of plants. Uh, but uh, 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 we introduced uh, one of these coppered hives into uh, the greenhouse and very quickly uh, the bees learned to forage uh, on, uh, on these Mimulus cutatus. Uh, what we found was uh, uh, pretty much what, what I suspected. Uh, these bees discriminated very strongly against inbred plants. Uh, uh, what I initially expected was once a bee uh, sampled an inbred plant, uh, it would uh, it would stop the visit to the plant and then move on to to uh, someplace better. Uh, and we saw that. So so bees probed inbred plants less often uh, than outbred plants once they arrived. But the biggest effect was that that the bumblebees were arriving at uh, uh, inbred plants at a rate much less than they were arriving at outbred plants. And so that was my first suspicion uh, that that they were using either visual cues or olfactory cues uh, in making their decision. Uh, they, they didn't have to arrive at a plant uh, to, to make that discrimination. Now, of course, inbred plants differ from outbred plants uh, uh, in more ways than just pollen viability and, and by extension, the reward they're able to offer these pollinators. Uh, inbred plants, we we uh, we knew produce smaller flowers. They tend to produce fewer flowers. Uh, but even when we controlled for flower size and display size, this effective inbreeding uh, still came through. Uh, the the pollinators were discriminating against the those inbred plants. Uh, my postdoc Chris Ivy and I. Uh, repeated this experiment, uh, slightly different design, but uh, this time uh, out in the wild, out in California in the native habitat with their native pollinators at the same time that natural Mimulus cutatus populations were in flower. And we basically saw the same pattern. Uh, bees were arriving at uh, uh, Mimulus uh, inbred mimulus much less often than outbred mimulus. So uh, we really felt that we had a robust result here. The one thing we hadn't established though is whether the, the, the difference in reward between inbred and outbred plants uh, was really driving this. And one of my uh, REU students, one of these undergraduates that we have at Blandy in the summer, Haley Hart, did an experiment where she uh, measured the pollen viability on every one of these plants that we had in the greenhouse, uh, and then looked at uh, how uh, the pollen viability isolated from the size of the flower and the display size of the plant affected visitation. And somewhat to my satisfaction, she found that there was a significant relationship between pollen viability and uh, the frequency of visitation by these bees. Uh, but uh, an R square of 0.05 was a little unsatisfying. So pollen viability was, was uh, uh, explaining only about 5% of the variation in visitation. And what was even more uh, dissatisfying was the fact that most of the variability that I was able to produce and viability for this experiment was still being produced by, by inbreeding. Uh, 
I finally got a chance uh, to to uh, do what I thought was the ideal experiment a few years later uh, when I was working again with uh, uh, Samari U students. And in a separate project, uh, I had been uh, uh, doing artificial selection on mimulus and, and quite by accident, uh, I developed a uh, male sterile uh, mimulus cutatus. Uh, these plants were fully outbred. Uh, they, their corolla size uh, uh, was identical to fully fertile uh, mimulus cutatus, uh, but these plants produced absolutely no pollen and therefore had essentially no reward to offer uh, pollinators. And so Kate LaCroix uh, and later Rosie Link uh, did the experiment I, I had been wanting to do for a long time, where we compared uh, uh, populations, uh, a, a sort of a control outcross population uh, that had sort of normal pollen viability, uh, nearly 90% viable pollen. And then these outbred plants uh, our outbred populations, I call OL and OH, who had significantly reduced pollen viability. In fact, their pollen viability was uh, equivalent to the pollen viability that we saw in these inbred plants. I was expecting, of course, then when we allowed pollinators to forage on these plants, uh, that uh, they, those pollinators would discriminate against the inbred plants, uh, discriminate against these low viability, low pollen viability outbred plants and greatly prefer these uh, outbred controls. In fact, what we saw was exactly what I saw in those earlier experiments. The pollinators discriminated against inbred plants uh, and they preferred outbred plants whether the outbred plant produced viable pollen or not. Uh, and so it seemed that there was something about outbred plants uh, that these bees were responding to. Uh, these are the results from Kate LaCroix's summer at Blandy. And I was so <laughs> sure that, that, uh, uh, that, that this could not possibly be true, that bees are, are much smarter than this, uh, that I had uh, Rosie Link uh, uh, repeat the same experiment the following year, and she found basically the same thing. Strong discrimination against inbred plants and no discrimination against outbred plants, even it, uh, if they came from low viability uh, populations, low pollen viability populations. Meanwhile, uh, I had a third RU student, Deasia Lee, and she was doing experiments uh, using artificial flowers. Uh, we created the, these little uh, cutout corollas and fitted them with these micro centrifuge tubes. And we would provision these little artificial flowers uh, with, with anthers uh, from both inbred and outbred plants. Uh, half of the anthers had low pollen viability and half of the anthers had high pollen viability. And what DeAsia found was uh, that the bees were actually pretty good at discriminating uh, and finding the artificial flowers uh, that had high pollen viability, discriminating against the artificial flowers that had low pollen viability. And they would prefer high viability pollen, whether it came from an inbred or an outbred plant. So in artificial plants, uh, the, the bees were acting exactly as I might expect them to, but in the, in the natural plants, in the live plants, uh, they, they were not. So in summary, for this first part of the seminar, uh, uh, we have found that the bees prefer outbred plants over inbred plants, uh, but the difference in their preference seemed to have very little to do with 
uh, uh, the quality of the rewards these plants offer, at least in live plants. But when foraging on artificial plants, the bees demonstrated a strong preference for fertile, that is rewarding anthers. So from here, uh, I got a graduate student, Ariella Haber, who began looking at the volatile uh, compounds that these flowers were producing. And uh, she looked at plants uh, that were fully outbred and compared them to plants that had been uh, uh, self-pollinated for three consecutive generations. Uh, what she did was uh, uh, to uh, put these glass domes over top of uh, uh, flowering mimulus uh, pump air into those domes and pull the air through these filters. Uh, the filter would trap any uh, VOC compounds uh, that, that the air was now carrying. Uh, Ariel, Ariella would then elute uh, those compounds with dichloromethane. Uh, quantify the compounds using a GCFID and identify the compounds using a GC NAS spec in collaboration with uh, Consuela de Mares and, and Mark Mesher, uh, originally at Penn State, but uh, later uh, in our collaboration uh, moving to ETH Zurich. So this is uh, what uh, Ariella would get when, when she uh, uh, ran her samples on, on the uh, 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 gas chromatograph. Uh, each one of these peaks represents a compound uh, produced by uh, Mimulus guttatus. Uh, we characterize uh, inbred and outbred plants first uh, by doing a principal component analysis. And uh, this graph shows principal component one, which explains most of the variation in the uh, uh, volatile compounds. And you can see that uh, outbred plants uh, uh, produce a significantly different uh, blend of compounds than uh, inbred plants. Uh, over here on uh, the right graph are the actual individual compounds ranked from lowest emission to largest emission. And what you can see in this graph is that there are three compounds that explain most of the difference between inbred and outbred plants. Uh, uh, alpha bergamotine here, the 10th ranked compound. Uh, uh, methyl butyl benzoate, uh, and the second most emitted compound, beta trans bergamotine. And uh, you'll be hearing lots about uh, beta trans bergamotine from here on out. So uh, if you compare inbred and outbred plants for these uh, three chemicals, all three uh, of these VOCs differ significantly between inbred and outbred plants. Uh, but the biggest effect was on uh, beta trans bergamotine. And, and we uh, focused in on this one particular compound uh, uh, in behavioral experiments that I'll talk about in just a bit. In addition to looking at uh, uh, the uh, differences between inbred and outbred plants, uh, Ariella looked uh, at the relationship between uh, different compounds and reward quality. And in this case, reward quality was a measure of how much pollen the plant produced and how viable it was. So uh, a plant with high reward quality was producing lots of viable pollen and low reward quality was very little uh, inviable pollen. Uh, and uh, she found a half dozen compounds that had a significant positive relationship between the amount of VOC produced and the amount of uh, the quality of the reward. Uh, we'll uh, be focusing a little bit later on 
uh, limonene, which had the highest correlation uh, uh, to reward quality. And uh, I'll also be looking a little bit at linalool, which had uh, a slightly negative relationship uh, between the VOC emission and uh, reward quality. Uh, interestingly, uh, I thought uh, linalool is actually produced in large amounts. It's one of the most common compounds uh, in the fragrance of Mimulus cutatus. Uh, limonene uh, ranked only number four uh, in uh, the compounds produced. Uh, so uh, even though there's a strong relationship between limonene and the amount of reward, uh, its production is in relatively small amounts. Uh, a third thing Ariella did when looking at these volatile organic compounds was to see if any of these compounds were being emitted directly from uh, the anthers or from the pollen itself. Uh, it would seem to me that, that uh, uh, the, the uh, chemicals that had the highest potential to be honest rewards would be chemicals that are, that are part of the pollen kit itself. Uh, but what she found is none of those chemicals that I showed you a moment ago were produced uh, directly from the pollen. Uh, in fact, we were able uh, to, to uh, uh, capture only a single compound uh, from, uh, from uh, fertile anthers, and that was nonodecane. Uh, this n-octane and nonal acetate are just uh, uh, internal standards that we add to the samples. Uh, and so uh, viable anthers uh, produce nonodecane, sterile anthers do not. And so uh, that might also be a potential cue uh, for uh, pollinators, uh, but uh, nonodecane is not a very volatile compound. Uh, Ariella was never able to detect nonodecane uh, when she was uh, sampling from uh, whole flowers. She was only ever able to detect it when she had a mass of anthers in those uh, uh, collectors. Uh, uh, and uh, nonodecane's a wax, and it has uh, a very low volatile volatility. Uh, so it's not uh, obviously the greatest signal uh, that, that these plants might be producing. So in, in summary of, of this, uh, this volatile work, what we found is that inbred plants uh, differed from outbred plants in the mix of VOCs that they produce. Uh, uh, beta transbergamatine was the second most abundant VOC in outbred plants, but it accounted for the biggest single difference uh, between inbred and outbred plants. Uh, we found uh, six uh, VOCs in what we call the headspace collection of, of whole flowers that showed positive relationships with reward quality. And so we regarded these as potential uh, honest signals. Uh, but these, these VOCs are not produced uh, by pollen. Uh, pollen produces only uh, nonodecane. Uh, and uh, although it's a very weak signal, we thought it could potentially be uh, an honest signal if bees were able to pick up on it. And so the third component of my talk it, it are the behavioral assays that we did uh, using uh, uh, these volatile signals from Mimulus cutatus. And so to do these experiments, uh, we would put uh, flowers in, in in glass chambers like this, uh, and then transfer uh, using, using a pump or uh, an air canister, transfer the scent from those flowers into uh, either Y tubes, or as you'll see in a second, uh, arenas where we could do pairwise tests. Uh, 
uh, in addition to whole flowers, uh, we also had extracts of the scent uh, dissolved in, in dichloromethane, uh, but we were able to put those extracts on the silica septa and they would slow release that scent. And so we were able to do uh, uh, some interesting controlled experiments uh, just isolating the scent that we had isolated from the plants. And like I said, uh, we, we did a lot of these experiments uh, uh, early on in Y-tubes, uh, but uh, we, we developed a technique that, that ended up working pretty well, flying these bees uh, in these uh, plywood arenas and, and getting them to interact with artificial flowers in the arena that were hooked up to our, our, uh, our scent equipment. And so most of the uh, behavioral assays were done in these arenas. Uh, the very first uh, test we did was just to see if we know that inbred, we knew that inbred and outbred plants uh, uh, produce different volatile mixes, uh, but we wanted to know uh, if bees responded to those different, uh, 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 the, the differences in those mixes. And so uh, after training bees, foraging on, on, on live plants, uh, we did Y-tube experiments with the bees, uh, giving them a paired choice between scent from inbred and outbred plants. And as you can see, there was a very, very strong preference for the scent from the outbred plants. Uh, the next thing we did was remember I have these these uh, sterile and fertile outbred plants. And so the next experiment we did was to give bees a choice between the the fertile and sterile outbred plants, and we found no difference whatsoever uh, in their preference. We then took those sterile outbred plants and uh, tested bee preference against fully fertile inbred plants. And uh, just as we saw uh, in the earlier experiment, uh, the bees showed a strong preference for outbred plants, uh, rejecting uh, the inbred plants, despite the fact that those outbred plants uh, could, could have offered them no reward. The next set of experiments we did was uh, to, to look at this uh, compound beta transbergamate. Remember, this was the chemical that showed uh, the, the, the biggest difference between inbred and outbred plants. Uh, and we started these experiments with naive bees that had never uh, been outside of a hive. They'd never forged on a flower in their life. And uh, we gave them choices between uh, plants that we knew produced high beta transbergamatine uh, versus plants that produced low amounts of beta transbergamatine. And these bees showed a significant preference for the high beta transbergamatine plants, even though they'd never experienced beta transbergamatine before, much less foraged on a flower. Uh, we then, as I mentioned, we, we were able to, to isolate the scent on these uh, silica septa. Uh, and so we isolated uh, 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 beta transbergamatine and, and used septa with very low amounts of beta transbergamatine uh, or very high amounts of beta transbergamatine. And these naive bees, again, showed a very strong preference for high amounts of, of beta transbergamate. So uh, it seems that beta transbergamate could be key in, in uh, 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 driving this preference toward outbred plants. Now, in a second set of experiments, uh, uh, Ariella wanted to see if if those compounds uh, that could serve as potential 
ana signals could actually be learned uh, by these bees. And so uh, uh, we, we got our coppered hives and our naive bees, and we ran them through our arenas, giving them pairwise tests. Uh, and then we compared their response uh, to uh, experienced bees that had the opportunity to forage on live Mimulus cutatus in the greenhouse and then looked at whether their uh, uh, preference changed. And uh, in these experiments, we looked at three different compounds. Uh, we looked at linalool, which if you, you remember, uh, had a slight uh, non-significant but negative uh, relationship be between uh, the amount of linalool produced and the quality of the reward of the plant. Uh, so, so I'm calling this uh, uh, an uninformative signal. Uh, we did tests with limonene, which showed the strongest relationship uh, with uh, uh, reward quality, uh, strong and positive. And so I'm calling this an, a potential honest signal. And then we used uh, anthers uh, from Mimulus cutatus, uh, uh, which we also uh, considered an honest signal. So we used uh, uh, sterile anthers, which produced no nona decane, and at least based on our equipment, uh, produced no VOC signal whatsoever and compared those to fertile anthers, which do show this nonodecane signature. So what we found is here in the uninformative signal, linalool, uh, naive bees that had never foraged on any plant before showed a slight negative response toward linalool. Uh, and that response did not change even after they had the opportunity to forage on live mimulus plants. So experience uh, did not change the behavior uh, of bees toward uh, linalool. Uh, but for limonene, the potential honest signal, uh, naive bees showed no preference uh, for limonene. They just chose randomly in our, in our paired choice tests. But once they had the opportunity to forage on, on live mimulus, they showed a very strong preference uh, for limonene. Uh, so that's exactly what we would have expected if they learn uh, that limonene is associated with higher rewards. We saw a similar pattern uh, for the anthers. So even though uh, nonodecane is not very volatile and the signal is not very strong, uh, these bumblebees uh, seem to be able to pick it up. So naive bumblebees uh, show no significant preference, even uh, slight avoidance of fertile anthers. Uh, but once they have the experience of foraging on live plants, they show a significant positive attraction uh, to uh, uh, fertile anthers, presumably through that nonodecane. So, uh, we concluded from this set of experiments that, that experienced bees really can learn these honest signals and make use of them uh, in their foraging uh, decisions. But then we, we, we essentially repeated uh, parts of this experiment uh, and added another step to it. And that is, uh, uh, before giving them the choice of uh, either uh, fertile or sterile anthers, which we, we placed in chambers in line with, with the artificial flowers in our flight cage, uh, or uh, uh, giving them the choice between uh, uh, high and low amounts of uh, limonene uh, that we placed just right inside our artificial flowers, uh, before that scent reached the bees, uh, we introduced the scent of whole mimulus flowers. 
And we use two types of mimulus uh, in this flowers. We used mimulus cutatus uh, that we knew emitted no beta bergamotine in their scent, or we used mimulus that emitted high amounts of beta bergamotine. And so uh, the first experiment we did with this uh, used fertile and sterile anthers. And what we found was experienced bees uh, when uh, there was no beta bergamotine in that uh, background did exactly what they did before. Uh, they showed a strong preference for fertile anthers. So they were sort of answering the call of this honest signal. But as soon as we put beta bergamotine in the background, uh, that preference went away. Uh, and, and the bees chose random. Uh, similarly, uh, when we used limonene, uh, the, this, this honest signal that bees seem to be able to learn, uh, experienced bees, uh, when there is no beta bergamotine in the background, uh, show a very strong preference for limonene. Uh, but you put beta bergamotine in the background and they choose randomly. So it seems that beta bergamotine is somehow interfering with the bees' ability to respond uh, to these honest signals. So it, it's interfering with, with, with this learned preference uh, that they showed uh, when we did tests without beta bergamotine. So to summarize the, this third part uh, of, of my talk, so bees prefer the scent over out, uh, of outbred plants over inbred plants. Uh, and this innate preference for beta bergamotene seems to play an important role. Uh, bees uh, are capable of learning VOCs that could act as honest signals, uh, but with beta bergamotene in the background, uh, beta bergamotene seems to override that preference. So uh, to go back to the beginning of my talk uh, and uh, uh, this idea of the pollinator mutualism, uh, I knew uh, when I put that slide together that, that I was putting up a, a straw man, as it were. Uh, we know that not all of these plant pollinator interactions are, are plus plus. They're not always mutualistic. And one of the most famous of these uh, 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 exceptions to the mutualism are uh, deceptive orchids that produce no reward, no usable pollen, uh, and no nectar. And uh, they attract their pollinators by producing uh, uh, visual and olfactory signals that dupe them into uh, pollinating the plant. And of course, it goes the other way. Uh, uh, there are bees like, like uh, the carpenter bee that visit flowers, remove rewards uh, without ever effectively pollinating those flowers. So these plant pollinator interactions are not always uh, mutually beneficial. But even in rewarding plants like Mimulus cutatus uh, that are being legitimately visited by uh, uh, good pollinators uh, uh, like bumblebees, I think there is a tension in this relationship. Uh, uh, honest signals, I can imagine, uh, could escalate the cost of reproduction for plants. And I think it's, it's fair to say that this interaction is more costly for plants than it is for the pollinators. And so there may be strong selection on plants to minimize uh, the cost. And so uh, 
uh, dishonest signals that are so well studied in the these orchids uh, may actually, I think, be more widespread uh, than we think. Uh, and that innately attractive compounds like beta bergamotene might be helping plants lower the cost of reproduction by attracting pollinators without having to escalate uh, the rewards that they offer. So with that, uh, I have lots of people and funding agencies uh, uh, to thank uh, for supporting this research. And I thank you guys for inviting me and I'll just open up for questions from you all. Terrific, so anybody have questions for Dave? So, Dave, are you, are you thinking that there's um, there really is a limit to the um, rewards that the plants can offer their pollinators? I mean that that's that's so uh, uh, costly energetically. Yeah. Yes. Especially pollen. Uh, so, uh, uh, pollen uh, is heavy in protein, uh, which is of course then heavy in nitrogen. Nitrogen's uh, uh, often uh, the limiting nutrient in terrestrial systems. And so, uh, uh, of course, plants need to produce pollen. It's, it's essential to reproduction. But if they're also rewarding uh, uh, with pollen, uh, I can easily imagine uh, that uh, there, there is a very strong trade-off with how much nitrogen, that is how much protein uh, you're putting out there for the pollinators to collect uh, versus uh, uh, minimizing that expense and allocating that, uh, that nitrogen to uh, other parts of your life history. Uh, and uh, uh, since doing this experiment, uh, I, uh, have a graduate student, uh, Jemima El Sherbini, who's looking at other species of mimulus that reward with both pollen and nectar, uh, and uh, looking at the compounds they produce. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the first things that she has found is that uh, the the species that uh, reward with nectar uh, are not producing uh, beta bergamotene. So interesting. We've got a question from Joe Francis. Uh, yeah, this is a little bit um, off topic, but you know, I understand that pollen is uh, pretty indigestible. Um, you know, the the rewards are pretty uh, well guarded underneath uh, the outer shell. How do the bees do it? Um, and are there differences among plants in terms of pollen digestibility? Uh, the uh... Uh, so most of the pollen uh, gets brought back to the hive uh, and uh, it's used by the, the larval bee uh, in, in, uh, while they're developing. And, and how they digest that pollen, I, I really don't know. I, I, I don't know how they, you know, get through that, that hard exine and, and get the, the nutrients out of it. Uh, but uh, the the adults uh, don't eat uh, all that much pollen. They're they're basically uh, fueling up with nectar uh, and and living off their uh, reserves of of, of lipids. Uh, uh, the answer to your second question is uh, yes. Uh, pollen uh, varies in digestibility. Uh, uh, there are pollens that, pr that contain, uh, secondary compounds that are toxic, uh, and, uh, uh, this seems to mold, uh, uh, the types of pollinators that are able to interact with certain species of plants. Uh, 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 they have also, uh, 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 the, uh, the, there's circumstantial evidence out there uh, 
uh, the bees will even use the secondary compounds uh, to self-medicate so that, that the, uh, uh, they'll use these secondary compounds to deal with parasitic infections uh, in, the, in their own bodies. So uh, yeah, there, there is a lot going on uh, uh, with the, the chemistry and makeup of the pollen that's influencing uh, this interaction. Thank you. Okay, and there's a comment uh, from Melanie uh, in the chat. Uh, let me just, that this just pertains to what you just said. Um, a lot of pollen as apertures, can everybody see this? With no or, no or reduced X sign with the germination tubes coming out where uh, there's a weak or absent pollen wall. Uh, Ed? Hi, hi, Dave. Um, hi. I'm trying to figure out what the bees are doing with regard to um, their, in quotes, understanding that certain BOCs relate to higher quality or viable pollen. I mean, I don't understand how they would, in quotes, know this. I mean, is there any feedback from their colony? For instance, if they're bringing back the pollen that's low quality, is there feedback from the colony somehow to them that they are doing this? In other words, there seems to be something missing here that I, that I you know. Uh, it, so uh, experience with the plant seems to be essential. So, so hands-on experience, as it were, with the plant seems uh, to be critical uh, for, for us to, to see these, these preferences for uh, the honest signals. So uh, uh, if we take bees fresh out of the hive, uh, with, with the exception of beta bergamotine, we usually don't see a, a, a strong preference for a chemical. Uh, it's only when they've had experience uh, uh, foraging on the plants that they they develop that that preference. But what if they brought back lots of non-viable pollen? How much worse is that nutritionally than viable pollen? I guess the viable would have more protein in it and so forth, like you mentioned. But you know, could the larvae still grow on? Um, the non-viable pollen and still mature and so forth? So I, I've never done that with, with bumblebees, uh, but uh, my colleague, Ty Ralston, uh, uh, when he was a grad student, uh, was able to look at uh, the effects of uh, the amount of protein in the pollen diet uh, of bees and uh, their uh, their larval development, uh, and, and, uh, he found big effects on, uh, uh, time to pupation and, uh, the, the, uh, size of pupation and the size of the adult. So, uh, the amount of protein that, that these bees are able to get from their pollen provisions, uh, uh, does seem to have a big effect on on larval development and eventual size as adult. Okay. Uh, but but we ha we haven't done that experiment uh, with the bumblebees and the mimulus uh, yet. I have a question. A really nice talk. Thank you. Are, are, plants are often mainly concerned with seed set. And inbreeders typically set lots of seed relative to outbreeders. Outbreeders might, on average, set 10 to 20% seed set, where inbreeders typically can set 60 to 80 or more percent seed set. What, no, what differences have you noticed in seed set between your inbreeders and outbreeders? pollen being rather cheap for plants to produce compared to ovules and seeds? Um, so uh, uh, 
there is pollen limitation in natural populations of Mimulus gutatus. So uh, uh, my postdoc advisor, Michelle Dudas, uh, 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 tested for pollen limitation uh, and uh, found that some, some populations seem to have all the, the pollinator service that they, they, they need to, to set full seed set whereas other populations uh, 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 seem to be pollen limited. Uh, Mimulus gutatus also has a sort of fail safe mechanism uh, for uh, self pollination. Uh, so uh, when the corolla drops off the flower, uh, the, the uh, filaments are attached to the corolla. So the anthers get dragged over the stigma as the corolla drops. And so uh, that can uh, uh, provide pollen if they didn't get enough pollen from uh, uh, outcrossing. So uh, uh, like I said uh, in my introduction, if you, if you look at Mimulus gutatus, uh, the average selfing rate is about 70%, uh, but that varies widely from population to population. Some populations have a much higher selfing rate, others have a lower selfing rate. Uh, but almost every population, uh, well, every population that uh, we have looked at uh, shows very high inbreeding depression. And so, uh, 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 plants that are grown from self-pollinated seed uh, do much uh, po more poorly than uh, plants from uh, outcross seed. And so I, I was emphasizing the effect on, uh, of inbreeding on pollen production in plants, uh, but you see it in, in uh, most other traits. So uh, 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 inbred plants grow slower, uh, they grow uh, to a uh, uh, smaller uh, size. They produce fewer total number of flowers. And uh, with my colleague, uh, Mickey Eubanks, we found that they uh, are much less tolerant of herbivores. Uh, so herbivores uh, really accentuate uh, the cost of inbreeding uh, in these plants. So... Uh, all that said, I, it, it seems that there uh, it is a strong selective pressure in this species uh, to outcross uh, if, if the opportunity is there. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, this pollinator service is an essential part uh, uh, of their reproduction. However, uh, you know, they, they, they do have these fail-safe mechanisms. So they're, they're setting full seed set in the outcrossers as well as the inbreeders? Um, uh, it varies from population to population. Uh, uh, some populations that the outcrossers uh, set is, uh, is much seed as uh, uh, flowers that are uh, supplemented with self-pollen. Uh, other populations, if you supplement the flowers with self-pollen, uh, those supplemented flowers produce more seed than flowers that, that relied simply on, on uh, open pollination. Okay, thank you. Interesting. Great. Well, uh, any other questions? We're running a bit over. I, I just have one quick question. Is beta uh, bergotamine in a variety of other plants or is this a mimulus compound? Yeah. So, so uh, uh, when, when we did this work, uh, uh, the identification of beta bergamotine didn't even show up in the mass spec data bases. Uh, and uh, the closest match we had to this compound was uh, 
uh, E-beta farnesine. Uh, and we, you do see E-beta farnesine in, in other plants, including uh, other mimulus. Uh, uh, however, uh, uh, we, we sp it took two years to identify this compound as beta bergamotine and confirm that it was not E-beta farnesine. And we are a little suspicious that it might be misidentified in other plants as E-beta farnesine, that it might be uh, more widespread than, than we realize right now, just because it, uh, the, uh, just from misidentifications. Uh, very little is known about beta bergamotine, uh, but beta bergamotine uh, is a uh, uh, a male pheromone in wasps, uh, and uh, it is an extremely uh, powerful uh, pheromone in the species it's been looked at. Uh, and beta bergamotine all by itself is capable of getting the full reaction from females in in the, the one species that's been well studied. And so uh, what, what we'd really like to do is understand, you know, what the relationship is between beta bergamotine and these bumblebees and whether, whether uh, it is uh, part of their own communication. So cool. Um, Barbara, you've got a question. So in listening to this, I couldn't help but generalize to sort of sterile horticultural varieties. Mm -hmm. um, do the results seem to imply that, you know, the bees learn eventually not to go to those sterile horticultural types? Uh, so so we've never <laughs> we've never been able to sort of uh, uh, get far enough with these bees that they will start avoiding those those sterile plants. Uh, uh, in any of the experiments we've done in, in these experiments, especially the greenhouse experiments might go on for a couple of weeks with the same hive of bees, you know, going out every day, visiting these flowers and, and we never see them, uh, tailing off on their preference for these, these sterile plants. So, so this attraction seems to be maintained at least on that time scale. Okay, well, I, I think uh, unless somebody has a real quick one in the interest of time, we probably should um, should thank Dave very much for a really interesting talk. Uh, terrific. And uh, our next uh, talk in November will be by Ryan Folk. Um, uh, looking at um, at actually uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria across and relationships, symbiosis with plants across a variety of um, geographic time scales, uh, climates, and so on. He's using he's using the uh, NSF uh, National Ecological Observatory network to look at these interactions in a lot of different places. So um, I think that'll be uh, an interesting talk. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all then. So take care. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, everybody. Thanks, Dave. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Doug, are you still there? Doug, who has the archives at present? Maybe he walked away from his computer. <laughs> I guess so. Do you have his email address, Kathy? Yes, yes, I can give it to you. Oh, okay, maybe he'll... We can get to him that way. All right. Thank you. Thanks for hosting. It's great. You're talk. welcome. <laughs>